We're very excited to have Matt with us because Matt has helped us put together um, our exciting new high-level primary course. So it's called Global Stage. And we have some examples from Global Stage in today's session. And if you don't believe me, there he is. There his face in the book. So we have this wonderful new course. And you can go on our website and find out all about that. But um, that's why we have Matt here today. Matt is a doctoral researcher at the Institute of Education in London. And his research concerns global citizen education in English language textbooks. And we're very happy to have Matt here because Matt also used to work for Macmillan Education where he was one of our regional directors. So I feel like I'm welcoming him home. So um, I won't keep you any longer. So um, please enjoy the webinar and I'll pass over to Matt. Thank you, Matt. Well, thank you very much, Mike, for that fantastic introduction. And hello, everyone. Uh, good morning to you, if it's morning where you are. Good afternoon and good evening. Um, thank you so much for joining me. And thank you for letting me talk with you today about global citizenship education um, in the English language classroom. Um, as Mike said, it's particularly exciting for me to speak to you, you know, across all corners of the globe. Um, I heard Brazil, Argentina, Ukraine, so many different countries, Mexico. Uh, it's fantastic to have you all, and it's a brilliant context in which to start talking about global citizenship. So why don't we dive straight in? Um, first of all, as I move through these slides, please do let me know if you can't see the slides uh, or if you have any difficulty hearing me, and my colleagues will uh, jump in and make sure that everything's okay. I'm just having a look at the chat box too. So I think so far, okay. Um, right, so before we, um, we start to look at global citizenship, I wanted to ask you to have a little think about uh, this question. Why does education matter? Um, have a think about how it matters to you personally, um, your own personal experience of education. Maybe you think back to memories of your childhood, that particularly inspirational teacher, that light bulb moment that really changed the way that you saw the world uh, or that you know, managed to um, develop those skills that have helped you be successful in your career. But now think as well about how it might matter to your students. Um, when you speak to your students, what do they want to get from education? Do they have particular ambitions for their career or aspirations for things they want to do in their life? Do they want to work in global business? Do they want to travel the world? Do they want to uh, look after their community at home? Have a little think about that as well. And then finally, why does education matter to the world? Um, have a think about that for a moment. Perhaps when you think about that, you think of all the challenges that you currently see in the world, some of the difficulties that we face, uh, some of the sometimes daunting futures that are ahead of us with artificial intelligence and machine learning, and the rise of robots, the growth of migration, and the population uh, gap, and, uh, and climate change, of course, as well. Have a, have a think about that. I hope when you, when you do think about all these things, you're finding a common theme. And that really is about what the purpose of education truly is when we start to think beyond core curriculum subjects. And to me, the best quote that sums that up is, is this quote. Education does not change the world. Education changes people. People change the world. Now, that was actually from a Brazilian educationalist and philosopher, Paulo Freire. So hello to our Brazilian colleagues. Um, and to me, that, that quote really beautifully sums up the highest goals of education. Um, and it also is an effective introduction to global citizenship education, which is an effective framework for tackling many of these things that I hope you were thinking about, um, really going beyond those core curriculum subjects and thinking about those high-minded ideals for education. In terms of the agenda today, uh, there's a few things that I'd like to talk to you about. First of all, I'd like to just 
give you some overview of the origins of global citizenship education. Um, and then we'd like to, to dive into global citizenship education itself. What is it? Um, I've identified three different, elephant, uh, different, elephants, <laughs> different elements in my research. They are global orientation, global skills, and global action. Um, and we'll be looking at those, and I'll be also trying to show how these uh, elements of global citizenship can be integrated into the classroom and are perfectly achievable within your timetable. Uh, then finally, we will have some final thoughts and leave plenty of time for questions and answers at the end. So where does global citizenship education come from? Well, it has ancient origins. Uh, a few quotes worth bearing in mind here. First, I'm a citizen of the world. Secondly, let us have concord with our own people and concord with people who are strangers to us. And finally, the world is a commonwealth shared by all. Well, that first quote was from Diogenes, a philosopher from ancient Greece. Diogenes actually coined the term cosmopolitan, which will be familiar to many of you and is often talked about in the context of global citizenship. Uh, that term is an elision of two Greek words, cosmos, the world, and polites, citizen. That second quote is from the Hindu scriptures uh, from ancient India. And the third quote is from Mozi, a philosopher from ancient China. The point here, and uh, one that I would like you to think of as we go through the talk, is that global citizenship ed education does not come from any one part of the world uh, or any one body or mandate. Uh, it can really be seen as a fundamental tenet of human civilization, which can be traced back to many ancient cultures. Uh, I've given just some examples there, but you can also find similar concepts in Mayan culture, for example, and many others all over the world. But I imagine in recent years, you've probably heard global citizenship education be banded about quite a lot. It's become a, a key buzzword, I think, in the education space. Perhaps your national uh, ministry of education has talked about it in its policies. Perhaps your private school um, has a, a set it as a key goal for the future. Or perhaps you've noticed publishers like Macmillan talking about it more. And I think that this particular uh, recent popularity can be traced to uh, to events in the last 70 years or so. And they begin really with the founding of the United Nations uh, and UNESCO, its arts and education wing, in 1945, shortly after the Second World War. Of course, I can say hi to Miss Veronica and her students. So I won't catch everything that comes up in the chat box, but hi, Veronica. Um, then the, the next uh, step on this pathway is the 1948 Declaration on Human Rights. Um, one of the key lines in that declaration is this one, which called for the education for the full development of the human personality to promote understanding, tolerance, and friendship among all nations. Then in 1974, UNESCO issued uh, a very famous um, recommendation on education for international understanding. And in that recommendation, they talked about the importance of global citizens and you know, uh, future adults of the world to have abilities to communicate with others, to participate in solving the problems of their community, and to have understanding and respect for all peoples. More recently, in the, uh, the last decade, uh, in 2012, uh, you may remember, I believe it was Ban Ki-moon at the time, launched the Global Education First initiative. And one of the key goals in that initiative was the development of global citizens. And this really culminated in 2014 in UNESCO issuing their guide to global citizen education. Um, and that latter guide really underscores a recent shift in international education policy away from quantitative indicators, so looking at increasing the levels of literacy and educational access all over the world, and focusing increasingly on qualitative indicators. Uh, and this has been as nations uh, all around the world that uh, represent the United Nations have come to think about the key challenges that we're likely to address and our, our future generations are likely to need to address in the future. 
and how education can prepare them for that. But what is global citizenship education? So the first thing to say there is, although I just told you about that framework that UNESCO produced on global citizenship education, you will find that this is a highly contested field and there are many different interpretations of global citizenship education um, and there are many different frameworks for it. So please bear in mind that this is my framework from my own research um, and I encourage you to question it uh, and to challenge it and also to think about how it, your own context might be different. But as I say, I, I believe there are three key elements to global citizenship education. Uh, the first is global orientation. The second is global skills. And the third is global action. Um, but before we go into each of those, uh, you're probably quite understandably thinking now, but why should this be integrated into English language teaching? Uh, why not another subject? Uh, or why even does it not have a space of its own on the curriculum? I think there's a very strong argument for its integration into the English language teaching. Let's think about um, a few striking facts about English language uh, in the modern world. It really has become the global lingua franca. It's the first language for over 400 million people across the globe, and it's the second language for over a billion people. It's also the official language for some 59 countries, uh, with many actually adopting it uh, for the first time. Uh, Rwanda, for example, a few years ago moved away from French as its official language and moved towards English. It's also the language of globalization. It's the language of the internet, social media, those big giants of Facebook and WhatsApp, uh, Twitter, and many others. It's the language of global business. And finally, it's the language of science and research. Now, these key uh, elements to the English language really map quite nicely to the ideals of global citizenship education. So first of all, when we think about um, that you know, a billion people speak English as their second language, um, actually, nowadays, the majority of English conversations occur between citizens of both different cultures and different first languages. In this context, intercultural communication and understanding is more important than ever before. It's not just about having the language skills to be able to talk to someone. You also need to be able to understand where they're coming from. And global citizenship helps us do that. Second point is around language legacy. Uh, with the English language becoming so prevalent globally, but originating from the West, from the UK and the US, you know, it would be uh, understandable if the Western culture came across with it and increasingly started to dominate in the world. Um, and that's something that uh, would not be good for anyone and is where global citizenship comes in as a framework to help us encourage uh, teachers, students and countries to maintain their own identities uh, in the face of the prevalence of this language. Thirdly, global business. Well, English, of course, uh, is a key medium to get you into global business and to, to help you interact with businesses and with customers all over the world. But to be truly successful uh, requires skills. Those four C's that we often talk about in education, such as collaboration and creativity. And again, we'll see how global citizenship um, plays a key part in those skills. And finally, thinking of uh, English being the language of science and research, we've talked a little bit about some of the problems that humanity faces. And we have the tools to tackle these through science and research, but global citizenship education gives us a framework to do this in the most just and equitable way. It also helps to look at global citizenship education in terms of learning outcomes. I'm very conscious that as teachers, you want to find a way to implement, the, implement this in the classroom in the most practical way possible. To do that, it's helpful to look at Bloom's taxonomy, which of course, I'm sure is familiar to many of you. Uh, just a quick refresher on Bloom's taxonomy. Uh, this was developed in the 1950s to help classify educational learning outcomes into varying levels of complexity. Uh, and it, it's named after the American educational psychologist, Benjamin Bloom. There are three key uh, levels that Bloom identifies in his taxonomy. The first is cognitive, and we can really think about that in terms of knowledge, the knowledge that students should acquire. 
The second is affective. And again, we can think about that in terms of the attitudes we want to instill in our students. And the third is psychomotor, uh, which we can also think about in terms of skills. Now, the three elements of global citizenship education that I outlined earlier map quite nicely to these three levels of learning outcome. Global orientation can really be seen within that knowledge uh, bracket in terms of the awareness of the world and its cultures that we want our students to have. Action, which is those uh, hands raised, uh, can really be seen as something that fits in the attitude category of Bloom's taxonomy. And finally, global skills, of course, sits within Bloom's skills uh, level of complexity. Uh, so I think that's a helpful framework, uh, particularly when you bear in mind that this taxonomy uh, has a great part to play in the, many of the scopes and sequences that you will see in textbooks, but also uh, many of the curriculum frameworks um, that your country may be using and you'll see all over the world. So turning to the first element of global citizenship education, global orientation. This is really about a positive, confident view of the world and the citizen's role in it. In terms of learning outcomes, what are we talking about? Well, first of all, we want the student to encounter their responsibility for positive global outcomes, a part they can play in making the world a better place. The student also needs to be exposed, <clears throat> pardon me, to multiple global cultures. They should encounter ideas of global interdependence whether that's the globalized world economy, politics, culture, uh, facing the issues of, of climate change and population growth together. Um, in general, the theme of global interdependence. Fourthly, the student should learn about global institutions, such as the United Nations, which of course they all have a part to play in and of which they are all citizens. And finally, the student should encounter the concept of both national and global identities. It's also helpful to think about global orientation in terms of what it is and what it isn't. Uh, it's always helpful to understand things in that context, I find. But what is it? It is a diverse view of the world with multiple perspectives, but it is not a Western-centric view of the world. And that's something that I will continue to reiterate and I think is incredibly important. It is exposure to cultural and national complexities. Um, it's not seeing the world in a stereotyped uh, fashion or in the way that uh, it seems on the surface. It's going beyond that. So for example, it's knowing that there is extensive poverty in the developed world and a widening gap between rich and poor. But equally in the developing world, uh, it's not all about hardship and you know, some of those cliched um, things that we may see in, uh, in Western culture, for example. But it, there are also wonderful examples such as digital entrepreneurship in Nigeria. And these are the kind of contexts that a publisher like Macmillan, uh, in order to try and meet the, the goals of global citizenship education, will try to instill in its textbooks. It isn't, though, about shallow stereotype perspectives on cultures and countries. It is about a critical perspective of the world and its injustices. Um, we are not trying to say to our students that the world is rosy and everything is fantastic. Uh, we are trying to motivate them and show them the positive change that they can bring about in the world, whilst understanding that the world is full of injustice um, and there are issues that need to be addressed. And finally, it's an outlook for every citizen with no exception. And I mean that profoundly. Um, it is not an outlook only for a privileged global elite. And we will talk later about things that you can do if uh, you are in a particularly challenging context, for example, where maybe your students don't have exposure to international cultures or you can't see the opportunity for them to do so. Uh, now I have a little bit of a game to play with you. Uh, I'd like you to think about a young girl She's an early reader of British and American children's books. She started writing from the age of seven with crayon pencil. And the characters in her stories 
were white and blue eyed. They ate apples. They talked a lot about the weather. They played in the snow and they drank ginger beer. Can you think about where this girl grew up? Uh, please put your answers in the chat box. Alaska, America, anywhere, Scotland, Eskimo, England, somewhere in the north. Oh, thank you. Fantastic answers coming in. Um, so the actual answer is that uh, this is a story about a very famous novelist that some of you may have heard of called Chimamanda Adichie, who wrote Half of a Yellow Sun, the international bestseller. Uh, Chimamanda is from Nigeria, and she grew up there. Um, and she speaks uh, in this wonderful YouTube clip, which I highly recommend you have a look at, called The Dangers of a Single Story. She speaks there about her educational upbringing in Nigeria, which was uh, dominated by British and American uh, educational perspectives and children's books. And she talks about the problems of that in terms of her own ability to empathize and to understand the world around her. Chimamanda couldn't see uh, herself portrayed in any of these characters, in any of these stories. Uh, and this is incredibly important because if we want to instill global orientation in our students, we really need to start inwards. Uh, we need to build that understanding of their um, local identity and local community and build out from there uh, into the world at large. And that's something that's very important to factor into textbooks, but also into the classroom context. A student should be able to recognize themselves in the world that they are seeing. So let's have a look at global citizenship education in the textbook, uh, specifically global orientation. Well, we talked a bit about global culture. Um, so here are some examples of how this can be integrated into the textbook and into the classroom. In terms of customs, uh, this is an extract from Macmillan Skillful, which is an academic English course for university students. Uh, my apologies, you probably can't uh, see that that well, uh, so I'll tell you um, really what it's talking about. It's looking at different global customs around politeness. Uh, one example there is that in Australia, it's incredibly important to be on time for a meeting, uh, whereas in Brazil, uh, it's perhaps acceptable to be a little bit late. I don't know if our Brazilian colleagues would agree with that, uh, but there are lots of other uh, varieties there in terms of different customs on, on global politeness. You can also look at global food. Uh, so we have an example here from Global Stage, uh, the English textbook that Mike mentioned earlier for primary school students. And you can see here uh, an example of Vietnamese food and Egyptian food. And then students are asked to consider what food they have in their country and how similar or different this might be to that of other countries. Um, here's a little idea for a lesson. Um, I talked about you know, the uh, prevalence of poverty in the rich world. Um, this is a, an audio um, exercise where students would listen to an extract about um, poverty in the US and the UK. Um, and then they're asked to listen, and they're asked when they listen to that, to find out how much of the world's wealth is owned by the richest 1%. Um, you probably can't see the answer there, so I'd be interested to know what do you think? And how much of the, uh, of the world's wealth do you think is owned by the richest 1%? Perhaps you could put your answers again into the chat box. Absolutely, yes. It's, it's pretty striking, isn't it? We're seeing um, answers here from anything between 50 to 90 percent. Uh, so economists uh, differ, but it, it does seem to uh, lie somewhere between 50 to um, 70, 80 uh, percent, which is pretty extraordinary. Um, so this particular lesson is developing the traditional um, English language learning outcomes of um, you know, listening to an extract, being able to understand what's happening, identifying vocabulary, learning uh, new items of vocabulary, but it's doing it in a context which exposes students to global citizenship themes. In this case, the notion that um, the stereotyped perspectives of the world they may have um, seen 
in the mass media are not true in reality. Turning now to global skills. So global skills are very similar really to 21st century skills and life skills, which I'm sure many of you have encountered and, and probably uh, seen teacher training conferences on or seen them embedded in textbooks. In terms of learning outcomes, uh, they're really about communication, cooperation, collaboration, problem solving, creativity, and critical thinking. Now, hopefully what you see here is how complementary these global skills are to best practice English language curricula, such as the Common European Framework, which I'm sure many of you work to, uh, or the PISA test. And absolutely, everyone's talked there about uh, the five or, or four Cs, depending on, uh, on which framework you're using. Um, so the point of that really is that you're probably already teaching these global skills. Um, what we're talking about here is about trying to teach them in contexts that are compatible with global citizenship. So more challenging uh, contexts which encourage your students to question the world around them. So I won't um, spend too much time on each of these uh, points, but what I'm trying to do here is show you in the Common European Framework as an example how these skills are already there in the uh, in the framework and subsequently in any textbook which seeks to map itself to the Common European Framework. You can see an example uh, here on cooperation. So the Common European Framework B1 level talks of the need for students to repeat back part of what someone has said, to confirm mutual understanding and to help keep the development of ideas on course. Uh, in terms of collaboration, uh, again we have another example here of, of the Common European Framework talking of, of uh, collaboration, talking of the need for students to feedback and follow up on statements and inferences to help the development of the discussion. And you can see this as well in problem solving, creativity, and in critical thinking. So let's now look at our, our little measure of what they are and what they aren't. So global skills are timeless skills that enable lifelong learning and adaptation. Uh, I'm sure many of you have con are conscious that uh, the students that you are educating right now will graduate and will enter the world of, of work and the adulthood in a very different uh, context, the one in which we are currently operating. A lot may have changed in the next 10, 20, 30 years. So we need to give them the skills, that help them adapt to that throughout their lives. But this is, of course, not a fixed content-based curriculum. It's really something that has to be imbued in your, in your students. Uh, global skills are inextricably linked with broader themes of justice in global citizenship. They cannot just be unpicked and solely targeted at creating effective global workers. Uh, it's very important to, um, to look at this in the context of global citizenship. Uh, so I'm seeing some, some points coming in. I will uh, go a bit slower. The third point is that skills, these skills really re require effective classroom context and the role of the teacher as the enabler. They cannot be taught by rote uh, or drill. So it really is about creating the right context in which to, uh, to develop these skills. But how, of course, how can we integrate this into the classroom? So here is an interesting example. I'm sure many of you use news reports uh, to teach English. Um, I've looked here at a particular news story, which is about President Trump's withdrawal from the Paris Climate Change Agreement. And I've looked at three different news outlets, Fox News in the US, The Guardian here in the UK and Europe, and China Daily uh, in China, of course. When Fox News uh, talked about uh, this particular announcement, uh, they said that it fulfilled President Trump's campaign promise and satisfied strong Republican opposition to the global climate deal. So a relatively favorable uh, perspective on the withdrawal agreement. The Guardian, meanwhile, took a very European focused perspective uh, on the issue and talked about how EU officials were now going to cut out the White House and deal directly with uh, US states and major US corporations that had already pledged to live up to the Paris Climate Change Agreement. 
China Daily, meanwhile, uh, took a different, slightly different perspective again. Uh, they saw this as the US really taking a step back in the world and uh, lagging behind other countries which were already moving towards renewable energy. So they saw it as, as the US taking a step back. How can we use this in the classroom? Well, first of all, we could do some pre-reading activities. We could use the pictures associated with each of these uh, reports to prompt some discussion amongst our students and elicit some vocabulary on global warming. We could then ask the students to read each of these reports um, or just so um, taking away the substance of the article and the report from the headline and from the uh, news outlet, we could ask our students to match the story to the headline um, <clears throat> and also simply answer what has happened, what does this news story tell us. Moving to a higher level, we could ask our students to consider what different audiences these newspapers might be directed at, uh, what position the newspaper might have, what is their agenda, um, and then finally what is the newspaper trying to say and how are they trying to convince or, or manipulate the reader. Uh, so you can see here that this is quite a traditional ELT task, um, but the context is a little bit different and the context is really trying to pick up that global citizenship uh, context and to challenge the student's perspective of the world. Let's have a look at some examples in textbooks. So this again is from Global Stage. Here you see an example of problem solving. Um, in this particular extract, students are asked to work in groups and to identify what went wrong at a sports day event at school. Uh, which they can see in the picture. So they're asked to analyze that picture and work amongst themselves to identify what they thought went wrong with the sports day. Some examples here around collaboration and creativity. So on the left hand side, you see another extract from Global Stage on collaboration. Um, and this is a good example of how textbooks can help you in the classroom by modeling the behavior first before asking students to do it themselves. So in this particular extract, students are asked to listen to uh, other students that are working together um, and listening to each other's points and taking them on board. And they're asked to consider this and consider how they are doing that before they then embark on their own collaborative task. Um, <clears throat> then in terms of the creativity example that I have on the right hand side, students here are asked to think about what problems there are in their local community. And from those problems to think about what kind of effects these problems have on the community and what solutions, if any, uh, these uh, students can identify to help address these problems in their community. So a very practical task uh, with a clear scaffolded structure I think can help you um, execute this in the classroom. Um, so it's been snowing actually here in the UK uh, overnight. So we have fresh a layer of snow on the on the ground. Um, and this video is quite relevant in that context uh, and also a bit of fun. So we're going to watch this for a bit. So I think I have watched that a lot of times now. I still find it funny, but maybe I'm very childish. Um, but uh, so I, I, I primarily did that to give you a little bit of a breather. Um, but also I think it is a, a really nice um, illustration of the importance of just thinking, really thinking critically and really questioning uh, the world around us, questioning everything we do and, and how we do it. Um, so perhaps a fun uh, video to show your students, uh, maybe even before an exam, 
to make sure that they pay attention to all of the rubric um, and, uh, and read before they ink, as my teacher used to say. So let's turn now to global action. So to me, global action is the most important defining element of global citizenship education. In terms of learning outcomes, first of all, we can think of the student encountering their complicity in negative global outcomes. Uh, now, I know that, sound, that might sound um, quite intense, um, but the point of saying that is that it's all too easy for each of us as citizens to blame governments, to blame market forces, to blame big private corporations about the problems we see in the world around us. And we really want to empower our students as citizens, encourage them to think about the small but significant action they can take. Uh, and that does start with encouraging them to think about their own responsibility and indeed in some cases their own complicity in some of the, the hardship and the injustices that take place in the world. Uh, the student should also be encouraged to discover their own bias. So being able to understand the perspectives of others, um, the important prerequisite of that, of course, is understanding your own perspective and where that may come from, uh, whether it's a, um, a national bias or your own personal bias perspective about a particular issue. Third is that student is exposed to contrary perspectives and views with an opportunity to debate these and to accept differences. Uh, the fourth is that students should be encouraged to exercise their responsibility as global citizens through specific modeling tasks. And we can look at some of these, uh, these tasks in some examples to follow, uh, but I've actually already shown you um, one when we looked at the, the modeling around collaboration. So I think that the summary of this particular um, point is that it is about global citizenship education and citizenship is the key word. It's not about global awareness, which of course is a key element of global citizenship education, but it's not global awareness alone. It is global citizenship. And that word citizenship is key because citizen denotes both rights and responsibilities uh, to those that take up, uh, take up that term. So again, let's look at global action in terms of what it is and what it isn't. It is a critical consciousness in every citizen. It is not the parroting of Western democratic ideals. The point there is, you know, this is not about some uh, perceived right way of doing things or right way for the world to be. It's about questioning the world around us and questioning all these different perspectives and points of view. It is about teachers encouraging their students to question the world, its injustices, and their part in it. It is not about teachers taking busloads of students to political rallies. Um, it might be, of course, but I think this is a good, uh, good point to say that um, in order for you to instill global action in your students, you don't need to create a mock United Nations um, conference uh, or take your students to political rallies. Um, you can focus on the most important part, in my perspective, in my view, which is in getting your students to question the world around them and the injustice that there may be. Uh, the third point is about the student's recognition and acceptance that there will be irreconcilable differences amongst their peers and the world. And this is important because, again, uh, to reiterate that point, that it is not about a universal consensus of what is good. So here are a few examples in the classroom. Uh, so this is a textbook extract, uh, again from Global Stage, that you could uh, implement in the classroom. Um, here we see a modeling exercise, first of all. So we listen to two girls talking about what they are going to do to go green. Uh, in other words, to help address climate change and to be sustainable and environmentally friendly uh, in their local community. And after hearing those students and that kind of that modeling of that, we then see uh, an example here of, a, of an exercise that encourages students to think about what they can do in their community and what small but significant uh, actions they can take. Um, and here's an, another idea that you could uh, use in your classroom. 
um, if we look at global geography. So global geography, I think, is a, a great um, theme to, to teach many English language skills and many items of vocabulary in the classroom. Um, this here is the world map that will be familiar to all of you. It's used all over the world. It's the standard um, world map. It's called the Mercator world map, and it was designed in the 16th century by a Flemish geographer called Gerardus Mercator. If you look a bit closer in that map, you might see a few things that are puzzling. So let's highlight, for example, the UK and India. <clears throat> so here is the UK and India, just brought out um, side by side. I've not changed any ratios or perspectives on that map. How much bigger do you think India is to the UK? Do you think it's double the size, triple the size? Maybe put your thoughts in the chat box. So I'm seeing lots of uh, variety here from three times the size to uh, I think up to 70, um, uh, which is fantastic. So many of you have already uh, identified what's going on here. Um, so I, I think in reality, probably if you were just to look at this map, it's probably about um, double or, or triple the size. But in the real world, um, India is 13 times the size of the UK at 3.2 million square kilometers. So clearly this map uh, is not a correct depiction. Um, here we have another map uh, called the Gaul Peters projection. Now, this map intends to correct some of these imbalances. Um, you'll see here, if we look again at the UK and India, we see a more accurate reflection of the relative sizes of the two countries. You also see, when you look at that map, a much more accurate uh, depiction of the scale of Africa. The USA, China, India, Europe, and Japan can all fit into the continent of Africa. Meanwhile, Europe is adjusted here to reflect its true scale, which is much smaller than the map that many of us will be accustomed to. But this map still remains problematic. Um, your students might ask, and you might ask, why is, the we is Western Europe in the center of the map and at the top? Doesn't that change the perspective? Is size really the only factor in determining our global view of the world? Are the importance of the North and South Poles sufficiently reflected? Uh, they're largely ignored on most maps, but they're actually fundamental to our future existence. There are some alternatives uh, to these maps. We could look at the world by economic output, for example. Uh, this is the picture of the world by economic output. You see how bloated um, Europe is and how small, um, in relative terms, Africa is. Here is a map by life expectancy. Uh, pretty shocking. If you look at this, you see some uh, pretty appalling rates in parts of Africa, uh, elsewhere in the world, and a huge gap between uh, countries like Canada and parts of Africa. We could also look at the world from the south up. We could flip that Gaul Peters projection and look at how the world might look if we had it the other way around. Um, and when you look at it this way, our eye is drawn straight away to South America, for example, uh, which, if you think about it, might change our perspective on you know, who are the drivers of world change and where, where important things are happening. There's, of course, also the polar projection. I don't know if you, if you recognize this, but this is probably the most accurate depiction of the world because it's the world as it is, as a sphere. And this is the world uh, map that is used for the United Nations logo. So hopefully you, you've seen some ideas there. You could teach many vocabulary items and um, you know, items of critical thinking and collaboration by looking at all these maps. And hopefully the context would encourage your students to see the world a little bit differently um, and to question the world around them. So some final thoughts. Um, first of all, there are lots of resources available to you if you are looking to embed global sense of education in your English classroom. We've looked at the textbook, for example, but there are also other initiatives um, out there. I wanted to highlight one from the British Council, um, which is an initiative that partners schools globally um, with um, counterpoints in different parts of the world. 
Uh, they do this by connecting those schools through digital technology, through webinar links, through Skype, etc. And the idea is that children and teachers are able to exchange culture and knowledge through this scheme. Uh, there's a wonderful quote here I found about a recent um, partnership run by the British Council, which was a school in Jordan with a school in the UK. And a 10th grade student there said that she had become friends with the girls in the UK, spending a lot of time chatting, and they talked about their hopes and aspirations, but also about the challenges they face in life. Uh, how wonderful they can identify and, and you know, come to um, a similar understanding of, uh, of their different perspectives, but whilst also seeing where things may differ. Um, this is also a good moment to point out that as teachers uh, that are using many Macmillan resources, um, you have a great opportunity to collaborate with one another. Um, for example, you could run a project from a particular Macmillan textbook together across your schools. Um, and I think I, I encourage you to look at uh, Macmillan's social media channels to link up with um, other teachers that use similar, similar books to you and similar resources. So um, some final thoughts around uh, the context of global citizenship education. Um, firstly, in terms of many of your students perhaps being very young learners and you thinking this could be quite difficult to uh, embed in your, your teaching for them, I would point out that there really can be progressive levels to global citizenship. Uh, it does not have to be about teaching the term itself. Um, at kindergarten level uh, or you know, primary level, it can really start with the basics. For example, the idea of shared values, the idea of sharing food, the idea of having different perspectives and points of view. Looking at language level, language level also doesn't need to be a barrier. Many of our students might have a very low English language level, but that of course does not have any um, indicator of their intelligence or their interest. And I hope you'll find that by integrating global citizenship into the classroom, you'll be able to give them much more engaging content and probably content that um, reminds them of why they wanted to learn English in the first place. In terms of time, I know that you're all pressed for time in the classroom, so um, I hope I've shown that this can be done within your uh, curriculum subject, within the English language already. Um, then finally, I just want to reiterate some points that I've mentioned throughout this talk. This is not about uh, doing business globally, about uh, giving your students the skills to succeed in the global workplace. Um, it is about that, of course, but it's also about a lot more than that. So I encourage you to remember the citizen core of global citizenship and the rights and responsibilities that they have. And then finally, that point that this is not a Western ideal. Um, you should question and contest even my own interpretation and adapt this to your local context. Um, and then I'd like to leave you with this quote, um, which is my favorite quote, really. Um, and it's from Bobby Kennedy um, in the 1960s. Whenever a person stands up for an ideal or acts to improve the lot of others or strikes out against injustice, they send forth a tiny ripple of hope, which crossing each other from a million different centers of energy and daring can build a current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. So I encourage you to think about that. Uh, you can be that ripple of hope. Um, we have some 200 teachers here all over the world. Um, anything that you do will have a small but significant impact uh, on the world around you. So thank you for joining me and uh, thank you for, for being patient and listening to me throughout.